A tragic moment in TTRPGs is a difficult thing to handle because you're having to take care of two different things. At the table, you're having to focus on the narrative, the story, the mechanics, what's actually happening in the game, but you also have to focus above board. You have to look across at the table and your friends and understand that there's an emotional connection to what's happening. Unlike in a movie or a TV show where they have plenty of time to go through all of this, sort through the emotions, record everything, edit everything, get it all just perfect, at a table, it's just us playing the game. And so trying to look at everybody and making sure that everybody's okay without removing the narrative stakes is just exceedingly difficult. But there's so many amazing examples out there of ways to do this properly. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is actually the second video I'm making on A Crown of Candy, which is Dimension 20's Candy Lane campaign. Surprisingly, there's actually a lot of tragedy in it. So if you wanna watch the first one, you can look right up there and go ahead and click that card to watch it first and then come to this one. But this one is going to be a little bit different because we're focusing on a moment that a lot of people expected me to talk about first because it is tragic, heartbreaking even. And we're going to start with talking about Emily Axford's character, Jet. See, Jet is this one character who's specifically, how should I put it, um, made for Emily. She's brash, she's irresponsible, she insists that she wants to go out into the world, but she can't because she's the princess of the Kingdom of Candia. Because of this, she is generally kept sheltered, but she just doesn't want to be. She wants to go out into the world and be seen. She wants to see everything that's out there, experience it all. And this would ultimately end up to be her fatal character flaw. I'm dirty because I've been preparing. I know now that I'm 18, I'll likely be taking Theobald's spot as the head of the army. Yes, and I think that we all are aware of. I was doing some combat roles. Your mother looks at you and says, oh, you would like to be head of the army. Is that why you've been so present as your history classes and learning the tactics of the Ravening War? She and her sister Ruby both have a strong desire to see the world, an adventurous spirit, a wanderlust, if you will. And while this is not necessarily a bad thing, they are both warned about it frequently from their mother and their father. Now, see, as much as they may have been warned about this, there's not anything that particularly tells them that yes, this is something they need to be worried about. They need to listen to it. Until we get to, well, the subject of my previous video, Le Pen. See, Le Pen was one of the characters, Zakoyama specifically, who died pretty early on in the campaign. And this is the first moment of genuine consequence to their actions that they see, but unfortunately it would not ultimately end up being enough. Despite seeing one of their friends die in a truly heartbreaking and very concrete way, it wouldn't really settle in the lessons that they would need to learn. That their ignorance, their brashness, is not something to be taken lightly. Because the consequences of what happened to Le Pen did not immediately seem to transfer over to the two. See, in the battle, we see Emily Axford's character jump forward. We see Jet pull out a water steel dagger and go straight for one of the characters. She goes right in and initiates that combat. I don't think in good conscience I can be strategic. I think I would be very emotional right now. And so I think I am just going to charge the Pontifex. <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> I fucking knew it! Lord. And I think I'll- The O shits himself. I'll just say, <laughs> I'd rather be a bastard than a fool who believes in a bull. If it's a fucking war you want, it's a fucking war you got. She has no hesitation, no worry, and despite the fact that Le Pen would ultimately end up dying in some part due to that decision, it doesn't seem to really register within Jet's head that she was a part of that problem. See, all she wants to do is be like her father, be, as they say over the course of the campaign many, many times, a war god. She just wants to go and prove herself in battle, be a powerful commander, and prove that she is competent enough that everybody should just leave her alone. But ultimately, that would end up not being the case. Her curiosity, her ignorance, and her insistence to rush into danger would be her ultimate undoing. And this leads into the story of how Jet passed away and how this one lesson would teach the entire table the consequences of their actions and also how to take care of a table that is suffering from a loss. But before we fully get into that, I wanna thank today's sponsor of the video, Describe. Now, Describe has sponsored my channel many times before, and honestly, I think this video is a great segment for it. Because, how many times have we seen Brendan Lee Mulligan show his fantastic storytelling chops, narrating things on the fly, coming up with these incredible descriptions and monologues? And we wish we could do so ourselves, but not all of us can improvise. 
Well, that's where Describe comes in. Describe is a storytelling tool for dungeon masters that allows them to look up a scene and immediately find professionally written descriptions for it. Have a werewolf stalking you through the woods? They have that. Want to talk about a dragon descending from the sky? That's there. Do you want to specifically describe what the dragon's breath weapon feels to the players so that they can know what their characters are going through? Also there. Not only that, they also have their sonic library, which is the same thing, but for sound effects. Do you really want them to feel the visceral crunching of those skeletons that they just fought and killed? You can look it up and play those sounds. It is an incredible tool and one that I have used many times and can't recommend enough. Describe has been incredibly kind to my channel and I would really, really appreciate it if you would be willing to give them a look. Links are in the description and if you go and help them out, it also helps the channel out. So it means a lot all around. But with that out of the way, I'm gonna stop delaying. Let's talk about Jet. As the story goes on, we see Jet go into battle time and time again, brashly, bravely, and ignorantly. She oftentimes drags Ruby along with her, as well as their newfound companion, Liam. The three of them seem to be a trio that are slowly growing closer and closer together. And even though that they are in incredible danger and their kingdom is currently at war with basically the rest of the world, they still seem a little ignorant to the fact that they're in that danger. They eventually return to their kingdom of Candia, having just escaped from one of the most dangerous situations they'd ever been in, in which Le Pen died. And now, they don't know what to do. The rest of their family seems to be taking this seriously, looking into what they need to do, discussing war plans, and they just want to feel involved, but their mother and their father continually push them away. And while their father does really kind of want them to be involved in this, he's willing to respect his wife's decisions for a lot of different reasons. There's some issues between them currently. So like a child, you just thought it would go away on its own. Lazuli not telling me that. That hurts, because Lazuli I loved with all my heart. And this is just politics. I'm gonna be better. <sighs> Amathar the Unfallen. Let's see if Candia can earn the same title. Uh, and she walks out of the room. <laughs> Yikes. The point is, they feel like they have been pushed away and are not being respected. They have proven their worth, they have proven how capable they are, but no one will take them seriously. And then, they see it. They see a note that was seemingly left to their mother, and that somebody wants to meet her. You see your mom comes out of her private study. Each of you guys make a perception check, if you'd be so kind. Can I do it with a bunch? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 10. I got an 11. <laughs> There's a little piece of tearaway lingerie uh, in your mom's study, like on her writing desk, and she closes the door and locks it behind her. Uh, you guys walk inside and you find a letter. It's from uh, Lazzie Fierce of Lazzie Fierce Lingerie, the madame of the lingerie shop in Dulcington, uh, who apparently has been a spy working for your mom since you were uh, uh, much younger princesses. The letter goes on to say like, um, I am uh, I am keeping it well hidden in the attic of my shop. I, I know that this is so not okay, but should we go try to find it in the attic of the shop? Yeah, I think that's where Mom is going, right? She just got this letter. Well, then let's go in Stelzington and find what this thing is. Hi. We are going to get in so much trouble. There is literally war going on. Jet. We can't worry about getting in trouble. There's war going on. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it works both ways. <laughs> See, here's the deal with this. What this is communicating to them is that there is something exceedingly important that is not being noticed. Their mother has been their largest detractor from day one. She doesn't want them to be involved in all this. And so if they have the ability to prove that she's been lying about something or keeping secrets, now suddenly she is no longer any better than them and she gets discredited. So of course the two girls are gonna jump right on this. And since Liam is becoming a part of the trio, they bring him along. We get Liam? Yes, absolutely, let's get Liam. What, your mom's tearaway Shh. underwear? They began to go towards this meeting place, wanting to know who their mother was secretly meeting with. And as they go into the tearaway lingerie shop, because of course it was a tearaway lingerie shop, they find out that this was actually a trap laid out for their mother, Cara Melinda. They go up into the attic and they find that there are four figures waiting for them. See. Here's the deal with this. When they found out the information, the secret note, it was because Brennan dangled it in front of their face. He literally said, make these checks so that 
he could show them that there was a note there. They did not ask to search for this. So in this case, Brennan would have had to have known that they went there. But the truth is, none of the three of them had any chance of surviving this. This was a deadly encounter. And I think Brennan knew that. It was an opportunity for them to prove their character growth. And instead, they went by themselves. Yes, they brought Liam, but there was nothing that should have prevented them from going to talk to Theobald, or going to talk to Cumulus, or going to talk to their father. There was a lot of red flags that said they should have brought everybody else with them. Time and time again, they've gotten in trouble for going off on their own, and this was the chance to prove they had learned something. And I think the truly tragic thing about this is the fact that Jet actually seemed to want to have learned her lesson. She was hesitant. She told Ruby, I don't know if we should do this. And while it didn't take a ton of convincing to really convince her to go do it, she was still hesitant. And I am harping a lot on their ignorance and their insistence on rushing forward and being generally irresponsible, but I want to make it clear, none of those criticisms are being levied at Emily or Siobhan. I think they're doing absolutely fantastic playing their characters. Unfortunately, the actions of their characters would lead to the tragic circumstance. And even more so for poor Ruby. I mean, she was the one who convinced Jet to go do this, and it was going to have some very dire consequences, which leads to a giant tragedy, which would inflict tons of consequences and very important drama and stakes moving forward into the story. And as players, it's really, really important to realize that our actions have consequences. And as a DM, it's very important to never lead to these tragic circumstances if it was not a player's decision. Unfortunately, this was a player's decision. As they see all these figures, Liam is able to go first. He's able to deal a hefty amount of damage, but then they move forward with water steel daggers. See, for those of you who haven't seen the campaign, they're all made of candy. It's Candyland, and water is deadly to candy because it dissolves sugar. Water steel is one of the most dangerous things possible to them, and it is deadly. And if all four of them have these weapons, things aren't going to end well. We see that Liam attempts to cast Rope Trick in order to escape, but it's too late. Rushing forward, they begin to attack Jet, and she is downed instantaneously. 53 damage to Jet from the first attack. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I am so fully going to be down. Uh, 51 damage to Jet. Okay. In second attack. I'm down. Okay. Also, uh, fall victim to the uh, uh, poisoned condition. This then leads to the tragic circumstance of watching Shaban playing Ruby staring down at this, horrified. She has to figure out what she's going to do, if she's going to attack them, and she actually begins to try and attack, to trying to defend her sister, and everyone at the table just says, you can't. I would like to shoot at the, the one that Liam has already shot at. Run. I think you should run. Oh, fuck. I cast invisibility on myself and I run. Run. Run away. And we see Siobhan seriously debating this before just simply saying, I run. I cast invisibility and I run. Because what else was she supposed to do? But she's still leaving her sister. And unfortunately, luck was simply not on their side. Jet begins having to roll death saving throws and rolls a nat one, which is two failed death saving throws. Only has one left. Liam attempts to help her out as the assassins leave, no longer knowing that Liam's in there because of the rope trick. So Liam desperately comes down, begins trying to make a medicine check to save Jet, but it's not successful. Jet has to roll another death saving throw. Another nat one. The character is gone. Hidden away in a veil of shadows. Liam, your hands over Jet's body as she looks up, trying to suck in breath, you do your best to attempt to fix, but the poison works. The last thing you feel is a bright, warm glow on your locket of the sweetest heart. Ruby, racing up the street as fast as you can, you hold fast to the locket. And just as you pass over the bridge, the light in the locket goes out. Now there is something very tragic here because yes, in the story, this is sad, but looking around the table is even worse. We see the pain in the player's eyes. We see the immediate regret showing. 
I've already discussed and shown the difficulty and the issues that these characters had and the fact that they did not choose to learn their lesson, but I don't need to say that if you look at their faces here. You can see the regret, the shame, the hurt. Yes, these are D&D characters, but they mean so much to these people because they put so much of themselves into it. And Brennan understands that too. And so there's a few different things that ends up happening to make this incredibly tragic moment no less tragic, but much more important to the characters. One, Liam tries to save Jet and fails, but Jet is allowed to have her last words. And not only this, we then have another character comfort Jet as she begins to pass on, and we have some of the most encouraging and incredible last lines a character could hear. You hear the voice of your aunt whisper in your ear, good job, soldier. You got her home. Ruby's gonna be all right. Thank you. <laughs> Work's not over. There's plenty we can do from this side. You ready? I mean, yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> In this moment, we see that Brendan is taking care of Emily, making sure that she's okay, giving her character some sort of closure, which is so important, but there's more that needs to be done. While all of this is going on, another character is dying. I haven't even touched on it, but Lou's character, their father, is being assassinated. He has been poisoned, paralyzed, and thrown off the top of the highest tower. You know what happens to a man when he dies? He shits himself. So I'll be happy to watch you shit one last time. I wonder if they'll call you Amathar the Unfallen after this and heaves you over the walls of the castle. And through absurd D&D mechanics, rage is a hell of a thing, he's able to survive. But Brandon goes out of his way to totally break the game mechanics for a second. You fall for hours you look across the bridge and see a glowing point of heart red light crossing the bridge and then extinguish. You know the moment that the heart red light goes out, the jet is gone. See, if you noticed, he said that he saw the locket, the magical locket, which would show if Jet was dead or alive. There's no way he should have been able to see that. It would have been absolutely absurd with everything going on, but Brennan understood it was far more important to make sure the communication was clear so that the players would have the chance to reconcile. He knows all the players at the table have already seen what's happened. And so in order to retread everything that happened in character is one, going to slow down the pace of the game, two, going to be an incredible slog, and three, just be unfair to the players. They want to process this. They want to do something about this. And to force them to slow down is just wrong. And so he gives the information freely. You know what happened already. And we see the characters begin to try and comfort each other, trying to take care of each other. Liam makes sure to preserve the body. We see them hugging Lou's character, desperate for some sort of affection. It's painful. It's so hard to see them all at the table struggling with all this. But they are given the chance to grieve in the moment. And Brennan even further goes out of his way to make sure that they have the chance they need to reconcile all of this. He starts swapping between different scenes, giving them a moment of levity, a moment of different pacing so that the people around the table can process this. He lets them laugh, he lets them cry, he cares for his players, which is beautiful and so important. And the session ends with Jet dead. But the next session continues and we are allowed to see this move on even further. But we see that they are unwilling to deal with Brennan's shenanigans. They need to do this. They need to take this on. They need to feel like they have done something about what happened to their friend. Welcome one and all to another episode of A Crown of Candy. I'm your Dungeon Master Brennan Lee Mulligan. With me are some of our intrepid heroes. Say hi, intrepid heroes. No, we don't have time for this. Yeah. Let's just get Too much right murdering to, to do. Let's go. And do something they do. They begin making plans. They begin making their escape. They begin working together. But all the while, there's still just this lingering sadness of what's occurred. A character did not learn their lesson and they made a mistake and that mistake cost them their lives. It's so important as a DM to make sure that any character death that happens, happens because of a player decision. They have to know that they had input on this in one way or another, or it will not be emotionally resonant. It will just be harmful. It will just be annoying. It will take you out of the game. It will make you not want to play anymore. 
There's a difference between simply saying an assassin snuck into your camp and killed you without giving the players any chance of anything and having the players sleep knowing an assassin is after them and not leaving a watch. Making sure that the decisions lead to the story is empowering for everybody. And in this case, Brendan made sure that happened, the players made sure that happened, and it was beautiful, but so sad to watch. This campaign has been amazing and doing such a good job of focusing on when to put emphasis on the player characters and when to allow tragedy to happen. And I know that there's one other moment in this campaign I definitely want to talk about. So please feel free to subscribe, like, all that stuff so you can catch the next one when it comes out. But this has been a blast of a campaign, a wonderful lesson, and so wonderful to see people being human around a table. And I can't wait to watch more. If you want to watch more of my Dimension 20 breakdowns, you can go right here where I have a whole catalog of them. Go out into the world, make it your own.